Hello, everybody. Dr. Cynthia Hawkins obtained her MD PhD from Western University. She completed her residency training in neuropathology at the University of Toronto, including a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Zurich. Dr. Hawkins joined the Hospital for Sick Children as a neuropathologist in 2002 and is the medical director of translational molecular pathology. She is a senior scientist at the Sick Kids Research Institute and a professor of laboratory medicine and pathobiology at the University of Toronto. Dr. Hawkins' clinical practice includes both surgical and autopsy pediatric neuropathology. She is best known for her expertise in pediatric brain tumors and has a research lab devoted to pediatric glioma. Her research interests include molecular, pathogenesis and, therape molecular pathogenesis and therapeutics for pediatric glioma and clinical implementation of novel diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic markers for pediatric brain tumors. The Hawkins Laboratory has contributed to the clinical, morphologic, and genetic characterization of diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma and pediatric type glioma, as well as the clinical and biological implications of mutant histones. I will now turn it over to Dr. Hawkins. Thanks, Angelica. Um, just checking, you can see the screen okay? Yes. Yes, perfect. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk, so obviously the whole uh, pediatric brain tumor is, is a large topic, so I'm going to today focus on the pediatric gliomas, and I'll take you through a series of cases and try to give you some sort of practical approach or tips on uh, applying some of the new WHO 2020, 2021 or potentially at this point 2022 <laughs> classification. Uh, so I have nothing to declare. As uh, was noted earlier, um, the main objectives are that by the end of this uh, session, you should have an approach to the workup of pediatric glioma, be able to apply changes in the new WHO classification of the central nervous system tumors as it applies to gliomas, and integrate molecular and morphologic data to generate a, a layered neuropathologic diagnosis. So going back to 2016, which was the update of the fourth edition classification, um, the major goal at that point was to try to formulate a concept of how CNS tumor diagnoses could be structured in the molecular era. So as we sort of uh, learned more and more about um, the molecular underpinnings of, of the different brain tumors, uh, it became important that as pathologists, we were able to incorporate that information into our diagnostics. And so this concept, which was first um, formulated at the, the Harlem Consensus Conference several years prior to that was this integrated diagnosis where we incorporate both molecular and morphologic data into kind of a final um, integrated diagnostic line. And many molecularly defined entities were first introduced in 2016. Now in 2021, uh, that trend has continued and there's been another major restructuring of the diffuse gliomas um, with incorporation of distinct pediatric type versus adult type entities. And this is really what I'm gonna focus on uh, in the lecture today. There's also been a number of molecularly defined entities added uh, in the glioma uh, spectrum as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today, but there has been also a major restructuring of the ependymomas, and that was to recognize the distinct location-based and molecular entities that have um, been sort of described in the last five to ten years. Uh, there's been a number of uh, additional molecularly defined embryonal tumors added. And uh, I think another important um, feature was this moving away from assigning grades based on an entity name. Uh, to trying to grade within an entity. And this has really been applied largely to the IDH mutant gliomas. Um, but I think we'll see as we understand more and more molecular entities that there may be a, um, for certain molecular findings, there may be, um, you know, a commonality in terms of a fusion or a mutation that we see, uh, but that our morphologic grading is still going to be relevant um, within that molecular subgroup. Okay, so the first case, uh, this was a three-month girl, a three-month-old girl. Uh, she presented uh, two sick kids with diencephalic syndrome and nystagmus. And on imaging, she had this huge sort of optic pathway hypothalamic mass. Um, you can see nicely on the axial section here, and then on this um, on this sagittal section. So uh, she was sorry. Um, 
she was initially treated with uh, chemotherapy without a biopsy, but actually had quite a rapid clinical deterioration despite that chemotherapy. And this was her imaging after one uh, course of uh, vinblastine. So the decision at that point was made to try to biopsy this lesion. And uh, this is what I'm, I'm showing here. This is just a, a low power view of the morphology here. Um, and I think, you know, you can see it's actually moderately cellular, uh, maybe starting to see some accumulation of um, potential lymphocytes around some of these blood vessels. Um, on a little bit of a higher power, I think we can see that there's probably some lymphocytic infiltrates. Um, most of the vasculature looks pretty thin. Um, and Looking on even higher power, we can see there's probably some eosinophilic granular bodies here. Um, there's uh, some neuronal cells in here, potentially a component of the tumor. Another view here is here we can see what's probably actually a binucleate um, neuron, uh, some more neurons, some more perivascular lymphocytes. Um, and if we look at the MIB1, we can see that this is, I would call us in the moderate range. Um, but given the age of the patient and the other morphologic features is probably still consistent with low-grade glioma. So the, my sort of threshold for um, proliferation in an infant is a bit higher than maybe what you would think about in an, in an adult case. So if we think of ourselves in the general category of, of pediatric low-grade gliomas, what do we sort of know about those? So in children, this is the most common CNS neoplasm that we see. Uh, importantly, it is distinct from adult so-called lower grade glioma. And this is a term that I actually hate because it creates a lot of confusion um, when, uh, when it, as pediatric neuropathologists, we call something a low grade glioma and the adult uh, refer to lower grade glioma as IDH mutant. But anyway, that was one of the reasons in the new WHO to try to really break it out into pediatric type versus adult type. So these are a quite histologically diverse group of tumors. So for those of you that have seen or have been practicing for a little while, you'll know that um, you can see all kinds of morphologies that fit into this overall category of pediatric type low grade glioma. They can occur anywhere throughout the CNS. And in the, in the upcoming classification, they'll be categorized under one uh, uh, or the other broad heading of pediatric type diffuse low-grade gliomas, circumscribed astrocytic gliomas, or glioneuronal and neuronal tumors. So this is uh, what the classification is, is looking like for gliomas in the 2021 classification. And I've highlighted in red these um, the entities that are new for this uh, particular classification. So obviously this overall split of adult type versus pediatric type is new. Um, there's pediatric type high grades, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then there's pediatric type diffuse low-grade gliomas, as well as some more familiar entities in the circumscribed astrocytic gliomas. Um, in the glioneuronal and neuronal tumors, uh, many familiar entities as well, as, uh, along with the addition of some uh, new entities. Um, some of these have uh, molecular um, uh, features that go along with the morphology. So overall for pediatric low-grade glioma, you know, we do run into this, um, what's more important, the molecular or the histology? Uh, when do I really need molecular for these cases? And what does the molecular mean if I actually do run it and, and get back um, a particular alteration? So we uh, at SickKids, this is just showing you one of the papers we published last year, which was looking at a thousand pediatric low-grade gliomas um, and what is the molecular landscape of these tumors? So I think one of the important sort of take-homes here is that you know, in fact, when you look at a large series of cases, uh, about two thirds or even a little bit more of that of the alterations that you'll see are either related to NF1, most of which are um, germline NF1 patients, or they're one of the, the alterations in BRAF. So either BRAF E600E, which is um, this group here, or the KI14549 BRAF fusion. So those really are the most common. And if you're thinking about going after common things first, those would be the first things to think about. Um, and then there's a whole host of other alterations that you can see that are individually actually quite uncommon, um, although they may be enriched in particular morphologies. 
So if we look at what are the different morphologies that have a, a relatively tight association with particular um, genetic alterations, this, this is this list. Um, and this is this table is sort of adapted from a similar table that is in um, the article that uh, David Lewis was the first author that's published in Neurooncology, and I provided you guys with that reference. Um, but overall, for some of these, this is a very tight association, and then for others, it's kind of an enrichment. So um, I think this, this figure kind of highlights that. So if we look at a particular morphology like pilocytic astrocytoma, for example, which represented in our series about 45% of all of the um, low-grade gliomas we see in pediatrics, we see that at least two thirds of those um, have KI1549BRAF, but that they can also, that morphology can also be associated with a number of other molecular alterations uh, that we see across low-grade glioma. And if we look down this, this side on the morphologies, you can see that that trend basically continues with a few exceptions. Angiocentric gliomas, for example, will always have a MIB alteration. Um, and PXAs, vast, vast majority of the time will have a BRAF um, mutation, mostly V600B. However, others like DNETs can have um, uh, different alterations, um, although again, enriched for FGFR. So that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Unlike some of the entities that are very specifically defined by molecular alteration, many of these pediatric low-grade gliomas are really just enriched for some, but can have a number of different ones. So when do you really need molecular testing for these tumors? I think for molecularly, uh, or sorry, morphologically classic entities where the patients had a gross total resection or even a good subtotal resection, um, the histology alone may be sufficient. For example, a posterior fossa, um, a pilocytic astrocytoma where you've had a complete resection and you're not really thinking about doing much else with that patient, you don't necessarily need to do molecular in that circumstance but some situations where I think the molecular characterization can be helpful. So the first is if there's be some consideration clinically being given to radiation or even giving um, chemotherapy, sometimes it's useful to have the molecular for further prognostic guidance. If you come up with a molecular alteration that suggests a very good long-term outcome, you may wanna try a radiation avoiding strategy, for example. Sometimes we get really small biopsies from midline locations, for example, that are hard to get at. And you're kind of left unsure, is this really a low-grade glioma or is this a high-grade glioma? That's a situation where the molecular can also be very helpful. Um, and a third would be uh, sometimes we'll have, you know, a patient who has a growing incompletely resected lesion and they're considering the possibility of a targeted therapeutic. And in that case, of course, knowing what the underlying molecular is so that you can appropriately choose that targeted therapeutic is very helpful. So if we look at um, how, what kind of prognostic information can the molecular provide us with? Um, this is just giving you an example. So on the left here is progression-free survival. Um, and on the right is overall survival. This is again from our series in Toronto. Uh, green is the NF1 patients. Blue is the BRAF fused patients. Uh, this red color is the BRAF U600Es. And the purple color is the K27Ms. Now these are all low-grade glioma patients. None of these patients had high-grade um, features morphologically. And you can see that the, the overall survival and the progression-free survival actually vary depending on what the molecular features were of that, um, of that low-grade glioma. Similarly, uh, we see a different response to even just standard chemotherapy depending on the underlying molecular alteration. So patients with um, BRAF-fused uh, tumors that require chemotherapy have about a 50% chance of responding to the standard chemotherapy whereas patients with BRAF 600 e only have about a 15% chance of responding. So um, you might want to, for example, jump to targeted therapies more quickly in the patients with V600E. So what about um, response to targeted agents? So this is showing um, a large uh, trial cohort, um, which was led by Jason Fangasaro, and when BRAF um, patients were given a MEK inhibitor, uh, they had a much better response than they did uh, to chemotherapy um, at relapse. And so just so that you uh, see how to read these waterfall plots, if the um, histogram is going above the line, that means the tumor grew on therapy. 
And if it's going below the line, uh, that means it shrunk on therapy. And this line here, it would be the 25% uh, reduction in growth uh, that would have been considered an objective response on that trial. So you can see the patients that got a targeted therapy were much more likely to get an objective response than patients that received chemotherapy. Similarly, this is data for patients that had BRFE 600E and were uh, treated with a targeted therapeutic. Um, for this, we collected a, a, a large international cohort of patients that had either been treated on chemotherapy um, or had been treated with a targeted therapeutic. Um, and again, you can see that BRFE 600E low-grade gliomas that uh, were, were treated with a targeted therapeutic got a much better objective response than patients on average that were treated with chemotherapy. So this is sort of a possible um, sort of uh, tiered approach to testing for low-grade gliomas. Now, there are some nuances in terms of certain locations are more likely to have one alteration versus another, but in general, um, you know, BRFE 600E is fairly easy to test for because there's a pretty good antibody for this and you can test with immune chemistry and that result will come back within a day. Um, and if that's negative, then, uh, you know, it depends on the center. You can either do a BRF fusion test if you have that, for example, by fish or, or a small targeted panel, um, or you can just jump straight to a fusion sensitive NGS test. And that would pick up most of the other alterations um, you know, depending on your panel, uh, that are seen in these pediatric type low-grade gliomas. If the BRF of V600E is positive, then considered looking for CDKN2A deletion. Uh, that also has important prognostic information in that patients that have this combination tend to have uh, worse progression-free and overall survival compared to patients with BRF V600E alone. And then again, if it's a midline tumor, consider doing um, K27M. So this particular patient uh, on immunistic chemistry did have a BRFE 600E uh, mutation. So uh, we could quite quickly sign out this uh, tumor in, in our integrated diagnosis uh, as ganglioglioma, WHO grade one, BRFE 600E mutant. And this patient did not have a CDKN2A deletion uh, by fish. So this patient then went on to, after we found the BRFE 600E mutation to receive a BRF inhibitor um, at the time that she had this BRF inhibitor started, she was critically ill in the ICU. Um, and within actually a week, uh, she responded so well to the inhibitor that she was out of the ICU and um, actually was able to go home within two weeks. And um, she had a drastic improvement in her diencephalic syndrome. Her um, uh, calorimetry was normal at that point. Her vision was normal. This is her imaging 10 months after starting uh, the targeted therapeutic. And uh, currently uh, we're six years down the line and she's doing well, um, uh, you know, going to school and has, you know, a little bit of vision impairment, but basically um, quite well-preserved vision uh, even at this point. So this is kind of a, a dramatic case, um, obviously, but we have seen quite a few dramatic responses to patients, even with quite large lesions when they receive the targeted therapeutic. Okay, the next case is a 12-year-old girl who presented with headaches and vomiting for about four weeks. Uh, she had diplopia and, and blurry vision for about two weeks. Um, on exam, she had bilateral papilledema, but no other real neurologic deficits. And this was her imaging. Uh, so you can see this big um, sort of midline thalamic mass, which had some uh, contrast enhancement as well. So she just had a biopsy done. I'll just give it a sec. I think the sorry. Okay, I think it's having a little trouble with the images. So this is the whole amount of her biopsy and then a little bit of a higher power. So you can see this is a pretty cellular lesion, but we're not seeing necrosis or vascular proliferation. Um, a little bit of immuno here. So this is the neurofilament just to show that this is a diffusely infiltrative uh, tumor and the MIB1 is a little on the high side. So this is probably more of a high grade glioma and certainly the imaging would have been in keeping with that. So what do we know about pediatric um, type diffuse high grade gliomas? 
So in the pediatric age group, high-grade glioma is less common than low-grade glioma. They're usually not the progression, uh, a result of a progression from a lower-grade counterpart, except for some of the BRFE 600E cases. Um, they're molecularly distinct from the adult type, and by definition, these are IDH wild type. And then the types are sort of loosely defined based on char characteristic age, location, and molecular alterations. Uh, so if we look at overall, you know, what are our options if we're presented with an anaplastic glioma or something that looks like a glioblastoma, we can broadly divide those into the adult type. On the adult side, you're basically looking at IDH mutant versus IDH wild type uh, high-grade gliomas. On the pediatrics, you can think about um, those that arise most commonly in the midline and those that are most commonly hemispheric. And then in the midline, uh, they're mostly these K27 altered cases. And I'll go into sort of these different types um, in a little bit more detail. And then on the hemispheric side, again, broadly, you can think about those that are most commonly arising in the adolescent young adult population, which would be the diffuse hemispheric glioma H3G34 mutant. Um, those that arise in children, which are diffuse high-grade pediatric type gliomas. These again are HG wild type and uh, IDH wild type. And then there's those that arise in infants, which again are also uh, histone wild type and IDH wild type. So in pediatric high-grade gliomas, the most common alterations we see are these histone mutations. And I'm sure everyone's aware that there's this really distinct um, location dependence. Now these aren't 100%, um, but they're you know, over 95% uh, true. So the G34R mutation is, almost always found in hemispheric high-grade gliomas, whereas the K27M mutations are almost always found in midline gliomas. Um, the enrichment is most in the pons, so 65% uh, six, of these diffuse pontine gliomas will have an H3.3 K27M mutation, and another 15% will have a mutation in another histone gene that codes for 3.1. It's about 50% of thalamic gliomas in the pediatric age group will have a K27M mutation, and it's about 50% in the spinal cord as well in the pediatric age. So if we look at sort of how do we approach the testing of a high-grade glioma in the pediatric age group, again, the first thing is to think about, is it midline or is it hemispheric? In this case, we're dealing with a midline lesion. So the first thing we would do is look for K27M. We can use an antibody for that, um, or we could do sequencing. Um, in this case, um, the immuno was positive for K27M, and then we have the corresponding loss of the K27 trimethylation. She had reti retained ATRX staining, and um, she had uh, quite a lot of p53 immunopositivity. So right away with just the immuno, we can sign this out um, as diffuse midline glioma, H3K27 altered. This is a WHO grade four tumor, um, and we can list the uh, HD.3K27M mutation based on the immunist chemistry. She then had sequencing done where we found the uh, K27M mutation as well as a P53 mutation. Um, and so then we would issue an, an addended report uh, once the molecular came back uh, with the molecular features added as well to this integrated diagnosis. So just a little bit more about these K27 altered tumors because there have been some changes in this uh, in the new WHO. So again, um, I, I mentioned the two different genes that can be mutated in um, these uh, histone mutant gliomas. So there's the H3F3A gene, which encodes for replication independent histone 3, variant 3.3. So that's the H3.3 that you see. Two mutations, either at lysine 27 or glycine 34. These mutations are on the histone tail. Um, and they're heavily modified residues. And so there's a lot of biological consequences to mutating these, um, although exactly how these cause cancer is not really completely understood. The H3.1 um, uh, mutation is in the replication dependent histone three variant. Uh, exceptionally, we'll see a glycine 34 mutation in these tumors, but it's by and large only the lysine 27 mutation that we see in that gene. So this K27M um, mutation is enriched in childhood, but it's important to remember that these, this mutation can occur at any age. And this is a nice study from David Solomon at UCSF, um, published about six years ago now, where they showed um, the sort of 
broad age range in which you could see the K27M mutation. And then particularly if we look outside of the ponds, um, older patients can certainly have this K27M mutation. Uh, and we know that the outcome for these patients is quite poor. Uh, and this has been reproduced multiple times. This is just the um, survival curves from uh, the, the London uh, paper from 2017. So some updates since the sort of 2016 uh, classification, um, there have been a number of sort of questions about uh, what do we do with this K27M mutation when we see it in tumors that are not uh, diffuse gliomas. Uh, so this, this mutation has been described rarely in ependymomas, for example. It's been described in gangliogliomas and some other circumscribed um, gliomas. And so a recommendation came out by the CMPEC now um, to limit this diffuse midline glioma diagnosis to uh, tumors that are arising in the midline, have this K27 mutation, um, and uh, are diffuse. So you wouldn't use this for something like an ependymoma. However, we do certainly see this mutation in circumscribed gliomas, including pilocytic astrocytomas and ganglioglomas. And there's been um, uh, our study, as well as a study from uh, Shriram Vanetti and Drew Pratt in Michigan, showing that even if you have a circumscribed glioma morphology, if you have the K27M mutation, your outcome is still quite poor. It's better than if you have a high-grade glioma with a K27M mutation, but there's no long-term survivors in patients, even with circumscribed gliomas um, that have uh, K27M mutation. Um, nobody surviving past say 10, 12 years. Um, so just very quickly on what is this K27M mutation actually doing? So we, we've known now based on work from David Alice's group that this K27 mutation inhibits uh, the PRC2 complex and the uh, enzymatic subunit EZH2 is the component that deposits the methyl group onto this lysine 27. And that's why, you know, even very early on, we recognized with immunostochemistry that we could um, sort of guessed that that mutation was there based on the fact that the tumor lost this K27 trimethyl staining uh, in the nuclei. And so as people began to use this antibody more and then also look for the, the, um, the mutation either by sequencing or using immunist chemistry, uh, people saw that there were cases where they saw a loss of K27 trimethylation, but they actually did not find a K27M mutation. And that pattern was also seen in the posterior fossa type A ependymomas. And so in the posterior fossa type A ependymomas, um, it, was deter it was found uh, by David Ellison's group that the, this was happening because of expression of um, this, what was at the time called CX467 and is now called EasyHip. Uh, expression of that protein actually had the same inhibitory effect on PRC2 complex as the K27M mutation. So by overexpressing EZHIP, you could lose this K27 trimethylation and have sort of a similar effect. And so that's why we see it in the posterior fossa type A ependymomas. But we also see a, a number of, and it's, it's quite a bit rarer than the K27M mutation, but it does happen that we see midline gliomas with loss of K27 trimethylation because of overexpression of EZHIP rather than because an actual K27M mutation is present. And this uh, paper by the French group, which showed that the survival for patients that had that pattern, so easy hip overexpression um, and loss of K27 trimethylation, but no mutation, uh, the survival was just as poor as if they had the mutation itself. And so that's led to these, um, this category of easy hip overexpressing diffuse midline gliomas being added to that category of diffuse midline glioma, uh, H3K27 altered. And the other new entity that's been added to this group um, are these bithalamic gliomas. And this was a nice uh, series, again, published from David Solomon's group. And they described that in, in, in occasionally in these bithalamic gliomas, you'll get an actual K27M mutation, but the vast majority of these don't have that. Um, many of them will still have this loss of K27 trimethylation, but that's together with an EGFR mutation, most commonly an exon 20 insertion. And so this uh, category has also been added to this diffuse midline glioma group. 
And so in the new classification, um, you'll see four different types of diffuse midline glioma, all sort of lumped under this K27 altered category, um, either the classic K27M mutant um, or uh, either 3.1 or 3.3 mutation, um, the ones associated with EGFR mutations or the ones associated with easy hip overexpression. Okay, so the third case, um, and this is the one where I've provided you with the digital slide. So this was a seven month old uh, boy and he presented with poor feeding and an increased head circumference. And you can see uh, this huge mass here um, in, in, on the left um, involving you know, quite a chunk of his hemisphere actually. Uh, he underwent a partial resection and um, I provided you with the digital slide. So I will now attempt to move over to this uh, digital slide. Okay. Um, so you should be able to see the digital slide now, I think. Um, yes, we can, we can see it. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, Hopefully everyone's had a chance to kind of have a, a brief look at it, but I, I think, you know, the main feature here is obviously this is quite a cellular tumor. And um, I'll just move into higher, a little bit of a higher power here. So, you know, the background looks kind of fibrillary. Um, there's sort of, I'll go even a little bit higher. Um, a little bit of nuclear atypia, but not wildly atypical. And most of the vessels look okay um, in, in this particular one. The, you know, I think there was very focal areas with some vascular proliferation, but it, um, I think in the slide I showed you didn't have a ton. Um, there's these sort of little nests of almost um, neural looking cells. Um, and then, you know, there's certainly mitotic activity was fairly uh, easy to find. So, you know, with this type of a morphology, you would be thinking of, you know, maybe could this be something in an embryonal tumor or, um, or a, you know, is this more of a glial tumor? To me, the fibrillary background is a little bit, would make me more thinking glial, but um, of course the immuno uh, would be very helpful here. Um, okay, so now I'll go back to the slide presentation and let me just go down to, so I don't repeat the whole thing. Okay. Um, good, and I'll just put my laser pointer back on. Okay. So um, this is just, again, the whole amount and this uh, a little bit of a higher power view. Um, on immuno, this was the MIB1. So, you know, clearly this is a high grade tumor. There's a lot of, um, of proliferation here. And uh, this is just showing you reticulin. So there, you know, there were a little bit of area where it kind of hit the leptomeninges where there was a little bit of reticulin deposition, but the vast majority of this really didn't have a lot of reticulin. Uh, this is uh, GFEP, so you know clearly um, at, at least you know maybe half the cells had clear GFAP positivity. It was pretty diffusely oligo two positive, and then little patches maybe of synaptificin positivity, but um, not uh, diffusely synaptificin positive. So overall, um, you know there's probably a little bit of neural differentiation, but probably falling into a glioma category. So, um, and I should say, you know, the INA1 is preserved um, and, and no other evidence of, of neural differentiation. So, you know, here again, if we go down this pediatric hybrid glioma side uh, and hemispheric, and then this is in an infant. Um, so infants are a very specific category of high grade gliomas. And it's just important to remember this whenever we're, we're faced with um, a high grade glioma in the infants. You know, generally these these have not been as well studied as many of the gliomas that we've seen in in older children or certainly in adults. Um, and uh, so that you know, up until you know a few years ago, there wasn't as much known about it. So um, this is 
uh, from our uh, work from our group, uh, but there was another very nice uh, study published um, from, from the British group as well. And, um, you know, in our group, we looked at basically all infant gliomas and we, you know, this was patients under the age of one, but you could see similar things in, in a little bit older patients. Um, and we basically found that the infant gliomas could be broadly categorized into three main groups. So um, low-grade gliomas that arise in the midline and are largely driven by RASMAP kinase. And, you know, interestingly, these patients actually have a worse survival than you might expect um, compared to older children with um, similar location and similar molecular alterations. Um, and then in the hemispheres, there's two broad groups. So there's those that are RASMAP kinase pathway alteration driven. So usually BRAF um, mutation or fusion. Most of these are low-grade gliomas. So in this um, diagram, the blue boxes are low-grade gliomas. And then um, there's this category, which are much more commonly high-grade gliomas, which is the pink, which are driven instead by um, receptor tyrosine kinase fusions. And most commonly, these fusions are in ALK, ROS, NTRAC, or MET. And so these um, hemispheric high-grade gliomas typically arise in early childhood. Most of these patients are less than a year, although you can see them sometimes in patients a little bit older than that. As I said, they typically harbor these uh, receptor tyrosine kinase fusions. And importantly, these patients have a much better outcome than what we think about for high-grade gliomas in older children. So in fact, their long-term survival is um, over 50%. Uh, and um, you know, obviously when we look at older children, uh, you know, our median survival is only about say 18 months. Um, so there actually are long-term survivors of high-grade gliomas in patients that present in the, in the infant age group. And the other important thing to keep in mind is that if necessary, these receptor tyrosine kinase fusions can be therapeutically targeted. Um, and there's a number of new agents coming out now um, that target either um, several or one of all of these alterations. So our particular patient in this case had actually a CLIP2 MET fusion that was identified on sequencing. And so uh, we were able to generate this final integrated diagnosis of infantile hemispheric glioma, um, CLIP2 MET fusion positive based on our RNA sequencing panel. Currently, these um, tumors are not graded according to the WHO, um, probably because we need to get a little bit more experience with the behavior, um, but certainly based on what we know so far, these really don't behave like grade four tumors in the vast majority of cases. So this particular patient um, was actually treated on a short course of chemotherapy with carboplatin and vincristine and is currently off treatment and doing very well four years later. And this was his most recent image um, in 2021. So you can see the resection cavity, um, a little bit of T2 uh, signal here around the edges, um, but no evidence of recurrence so far. So again, you know, clearly not a behavior that we would have expected for a high grade glioma in an older child. Okay, so I uh, hope that I've given you a little bit of an overview of um, how to approach the workup of a pediatric glioma, how to apply some of the changes in the new WHO classification, and how we can integrate the molecular and morphologic data to generate a layered uh, neuropathologic diagnosis. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. That was awesome. So at this time, we're going to move into Q&A. You may submit your questions via the chat box or unmute to ask a question. When submitting a question via the chat box, please ensure the message is to everyone so that the presenters and attendees are able to see the question. To unmute, select the microphone in the lower left corner. And once you've asked your question, please remute to avoid background noise. Um, so while we're waiting for people to type in their questions, I have a quick question that I've been asked a lot. So, you know, I, I've find this information absolutely fascinating, but I've been asked this many times. So what causes these varied mutations? Because it seems sometimes like almost every child has their own mutation. What causes these mutations in the first place? <laughs> well, that's a pretty tough question, Angelica. So, you know, I, I think obviously um, probably different mutations have different causes, right? So, okay. um, you know, what is like the cause or, or 
like how do you get a mutation is very different than how do you get a fusion and even different types of fusions, I think have different causes. So um, for example, if it, let's just think about BRAF, for example. So um, you can get a point mutation in BRAF. Obviously, we know that there's different mutagenic processes that can result in, in those um, mutations, although why we get them um, in pediatrics, uh, I think we really don't know. Some of them must be occurring in utero because some of these are developing so early, but what the underlying process is, we don't know. Then you have the BRAF fusions, the most common one, the KI1549BRAF, which is occurring because you get a little duplication um, in chromosome seven that then you know, breaks off a piece of the BRAF gene and brings KI1549 next to it and leads to this constitutive activation because you've removed um, the regulatory domain. And then in older patients, actually, the older you get, the more likely it is that you don't have one of those KI1549 BRAF fusions. You, you still can get a BRAF fusion, but it's usually with another partner. And as you said, it's the partners are kind of all over the place. And there, they're often um, interchromosomal events instead of intrachromosomal events. So often it gets fused with a gene that's just somewhere in a, in a completely different area. And so the mechanism by which you get those types of changes is I think very different than the mechanism by which you get just a sort of a skipping or, a, or an extra piece into the same chromosome. So my guess is that, you know, depending on your age, um, you know, these different mechanisms can arise and, and, um, and cause these alterations, but what they are, we don't know. I think the other thing maybe that's interesting about these is that very often the fusions, um, at least in the pediatric age group, if you see a fusion, it's the only alteration that's there. They usually don't have anything else. Um, at least nothing else clonal. Whereas in point mutation case, you often can get more than one. So, you know, BRAF U600E, as we know, um, can be susceptible to getting additional point mutations, such as in P53 or sometimes even in FGFR, um, or they can get a deletion of CDKN2A. Deletion of CDKN2A would be exceptional in a BRAF fused case. So I think there are the different stresses going on depending on these molecular alterations. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm going to start reading some of the questions people have sent in. The first question from Lawrence Kenyon. In case number three, is the neural differentiation entirely irrelevant? <laughs> as far as we know. So, you know, a little bit of synaptophyse and positivity in a glioma, I actually don't pay that much attention to. Um, if, uh, you know, you can see that in a lot of gliomas actually. Um, so in this particular case, no, I would not have put a lot of weight onto it other than to say, you know, maybe you would consider something like a peanut in that type of a case, um, or it's not like crazy to think about that. But, um, but overall to me, I think this is still firmly in the glioma category. And then next we have from Dr. Beatriz Lopez. Do you recommend that all midline cases, regardless of histological features, be tested for H3K27M and H3K27ME3? So basically no, right? So I certainly, you know, if I have a posterior fossa pilocytic astrocytoma in a kid, I do not do K27M or K27 trimethyl. Um, if I have a classic pilocytic in the optic pathway, I don't do K27M, um, particularly if I see a BRAF fusion. So, I, you know, I, won't, I don't want to say it'll never happen, but I have never seen K27M with BRAF fusion. Um, so for me, the, I test for the B, so if I see a, a low-grade glioma, I do BRAF E600E because it's easy and I can do it with immuno. And then the next thing I do, sort of depending on the location, so certainly, you know, in the posterior fossa um, or in the optic pathway, I would test for the, we have a panel that looks at the most common BRAF fusions. I can get that back pretty quickly, like within three or four days. Um, and that would be the next thing I would do. In the hemispheres, I actually don't. In the hemispheres, I go straight to our NGS panel because while those can have BRAF fusions, um, they are much more likely to have something else. And so it, I, I, I'll probably just waste three or four days by doing the other thing. Um, but, uh, but K27M in the case of a BRAF fusion, no, I don't, I don't do it. Okay. And then next we have from Melissa Blessing. Thank you for an excellent presentation. What do you feel is the role of neuropathologists when ordering molecular testing for diagnostic versus prognostic purposes? 
Yeah, so I mean, I think it maybe it depends a little bit on your center and your, you know, the ability to do the molecular and, and what the, the cost tipping point is there, right? That's going to be very institution specific, I think. But personally, I think the neuropathologist is the best position to integrate all of that information into one report. And so I, I think, you know, the there, the prognostic importance of some of these alterations, it varies considerably depending on what is the underlying morphology. So to me, you can't separate out those the molecular feature from the, the histologic diagnosis or those morphologic features. And even, you know, K27M or K27-trimethyl is, is a perfect example. So, you know, if you saw a loss of K27-trimethylation, that's a big difference if that's a, a diffuse astrocytoma versus that's an ependymoma. And so separating those out um, is, is important and putting that in the context of that morphology is important. And I think we will see going forward, you know, and I sort of briefly mentioned this, but you know, there's gonna be certain molecular alterations where you can see that in low-grade gliomas and you can see that in high-grade gliomas, or you can see that in low-grade tumors and you can see that in medium-grade tumors and you can see that in high-grade tumors. And the grade or those other features that we have always or classically um, looked at to determine um, malignancy, like mitotic activity and, um, you know, maybe lots of nuclear atypia, those kinds of things are going to still play a role within molecular subgroups. So it's, it's all of those pieces of information are going to be important. And in my opinion, all of that should be integrated into one report by the pathologist. Okay. And then next we have from Vanessa Goodwill for this classification, how important is the distinction between infiltrating, non-infiltrating, and what are your criteria for grading low grade versus high grade? Is it the same as for adult astrocytoma? So that depends that, that that depends a lot on on the situation. So, um, you know, if you can clearly say that something is non-infiltrating or something is infiltrating, then I think it's important. Um, but you know, there are certainly, and then it also depends on on the molecular alteration. So, for some molecular alterations, if you then it it probably doesn't matter. So, um, so if you have a, a something that you're maybe thinking is diffuse astrocytoma, but it has a BRAF fusion, then, you know, there, there is a category that you can put that in. So if you're, if you're confident, it looks um, like a pilocytic astrocytoma, then you call it a pilocytic astrocytoma. If you think that it might be a diffuse astrocytoma with a BRAF fusion, then you can put it in this diffuse low-grade glioma MAPK altered category. And those tumors are also um, you know, low grade, low grade um, behavior and should be treated uh, similarly to a circumscribed, um, at least up front, treated similarly to a circumscribed low grade glioma. Okay. And then next we have from Mohammed Harry. Great talk. You mentioned for morphologically classic entities with gross total resection, histology alone may be sufficient. How often don't you do molecular studies? Yeah, so I almost always do the molecular, um, but again, right, it's like I'm at a research institution, a teaching institution, you know, we make like we do, I do research on gliomas, uh, you know, we have a huge clinical morphologic molecular database that we maintain, so, um, so I do it all the time, but I don't think you have, you know, I don't think I don't want to say that everyone should do what I do. I think it does depend on your circumstance. And so I tried to think about, okay, what are some situations where the molecular is not frequently really changing anything? And, and for me, like a posterior fossil pilocytic would be a good example of that. So sometimes you'll get surprises and it doesn't have a BRAF fusion, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time, if you see a morphologically classic pilocytic astrocytoma in the posterior fossa, it will have um, a BRAF fusion. Okay. And then I am going to um, skip a couple questions because there's a question that's a follow-up from Dr. Beatriz Lopez piggybacking on Dr. Harry's question. In case two with the H3K27 mutation confirmed by immunohistochemistry, would you still generally recommend molecular testing for such a case? Um, so no, I don't think you have to. I think it depends a little bit on 
like the immuno and how well it's set up in your institution. So in, in, I find that antibody can sometimes be a tricky antibody. So in our hands, if it looked like that one I showed you, like clearly diffusely positive in the nuclei, um, you know, and no staining in the endothelial cells, um, I would not feel the need to, to necessarily sequence that to prove it. I, that's pretty confident that's real. I've found though that that antibody can sometimes be, give you a false negative. So um, if sometimes I think it's fixation issues or um, cautery or something, something like that, um, I've definitely had cases that are negative on immuno that turn out to have that mutation when we do the sequencing. The only other reason to potentially do the sequencing is if your clinicians are considering doing, um, you know, enrolling on some kind of a trial or trying to access a targeted therapeutic. Sometimes you can find things that are potentially targetable in diffuse midline gliomas. Um, for example, in the thalamic ones, you can sometimes find EGFR alterations. In uh, the brainstem ones, you can find PGFR alpha, occasionally BRAFE 600E even. Uh, so, you know, if you have the option of the patient potentially going on a trial, then it might be worth doing the sequencing. But I wouldn't do it just to prove that my immuno is correct. Next, we have um, from William McDonald, wonderful presentation. Infant type hemispheric glioma is listed under pediatric diffuse high-grade gliomas in WHO CNS5. Is this apt to cause confusion? And then he has parentheses, better behavior, high-grade family. Um, I you mean it might cause confusion in that it doesn't behave exactly like a high-grade glioma in the, in the pediatric? Yeah, possibly. Um, but morphologically, they look high grade. So I, I think, um, you know, if we're starting from like, you know, as a pathologist, right, we see an H and E, and then we kind of go from there. So um, it, it would just be to recognize that in infants, a high grade morphology, if it's in the context of particularly one of those receptor tyrosine kinase fusions, doesn't necessarily mean that they have a dismal prognosis. Um, so I, I suppose you could have put them in their completely their own category right, right away from pediatric type um, high grade glioma, but um, yeah, I guess we'll see, right? We'll see. Yeah. If it causes a lot of confusion that, that it might change the next time. Yeah. And next we have from Elena martinez Sands. Thank you for your wonderful talk. We use the break apart probe for BRAF to study duplication and translocation. Is it enough? Do we need to know the partner? So, so far we don't know if we need to know, if we really need to know that. So we've looked a little bit at within the KI1549 BRAF fusions. Um, is there a difference depending on the exon exon um, junction? There's a little bit of a suggestion that that's true in that, you know, certain fusion part, like exon exon uh, fusions, at least, you know, and the numbers start to get small, but some of them are associated with different locations. Some of them are more associated with the disseminated ones versus the ones that are, you know, the classic post phospholysidics, for example. And it, it certainly is the case um, in older patients that, um, uh, the, the fusions tend to be, I, I say, non-canonical, so not KI1549. And, um, and those patients actually, you know, seem to do quite well. Now, you know, that there's a lot of other factors in there. And I should say, you know, and I didn't put some of these slides in, but for low-grade glioma, it's important to remember that, you know, there's a lot of factors going into determining how that patient's going to do, right? And, and the clinical factors are important. The age is important. The location is important. The extent of surgical resection is important, um, as well as your morphology and your molecular. And, uh, you know, putting all of those pieces together is giving you the best idea of how the patient will do. I think it's at the moment, it's a nuance. So I wouldn't worry too much about not knowing the exact partner. Okay. And then, um, do we have time maybe for one more question, Sarah? Or... Yeah, oh, cool. that's perfect. Okay, um, so I have one more question from Elena um, Dowd. Could you elaborate on the thinking behind checking for CDKN2A deletion in a BRAF V600E positive low-grade glioma? What are you looking for, assuming we are not talking about PXA? Um, 
Yeah, so PXA is not the only BRF-recentering mutant tumor that will have CDK into a homozygous deletion. You can see that in ganglioglioma. You can see it in in some other like diffuse um, diffuse glioma looking uh, cases as well. And so we know overall that the patients that have BRF-E600E in conjunction with homozygous deletion of cdk 2 a have a worse overall survival than patients that don't have that. In general, BRF-E600E still has a worse progression-free and overall survival than BRF fusion, um, but it can take a long time for those patients to progress. Um, it's just if they have the cdk 2 a um, the curve drops a little bit a little bit more. So that's why we do it. It doesn't have to be a PXA morphology. Okay. And you know, there are a couple more questions, but I'm really sorry. I just uh, think there's not, there's not any more time. Yeah. So uh, feel free if people didn't get their questions answered, just send me an email and I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer them. All right. Thank you again for joining today's AANP Teaching Rounds presentation. We would ask that you all take a few minutes to complete a short evaluation, which will be entered into the chat box momentarily. Completion helps to ensure accurate reporting to the accreditation board. It may not display as a link, so please copy paste it into your web browser if needed. The PowerPoint slides and recording will be posted to the AANP website in the next week. And thank you again to Dr. Hawkins for an excellent presentation. This concludes the session for today.